John Amici, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, without wanting to bore the audience with uh, your impressive CV, let's just go through a few of the highlights, shall we? Organizational psychologist, founder of APS Intelligence, a chartered scientist, best-selling author of the book Promise of Giants, uh, executive coach, NED, uh, and advisor of two boards of several FTSE 100 organizations. A bit of an overachiever, are you, John? Is that what we're saying? I don't know if overachiever, but certainly I'm interested in achievement. That's for sure. Yeah, it keeps me keeps me. I don't know if it keeps me young because I don't feel it at the moment, but um, it keeps my brain moving, and that's important. Yeah, exactly. I yeah, know that's it. And um, you know, it's so interesting doing kind of the research into yourself. But you know, I, I must just kind of digress a little bit on on a personal level. One of the things I, I enjoyed most about hearing you talk about was being an introvert. And, you know, there's a lot of conversations about business leaders and whether, you know, introverts make good business leaders because, you know, generally you think of extroverted characteristics to be the ones of more success. But could you just talk a little bit about intro, you know, kind of your, your introverted uh, nature and kind of what you see with the, with the businesses that you work with? I, I think this is, so Josh, this is, this is a, such an important topic, not the bit about me, but just about, because everything, when you were starting to talk about people's perceptions of introversion and, and extroversion, and, and you're spot on, and it's so wrong. And I don't mean a little bit wrong. I mean, I mean, personality inventories are bollocks, is what I mean. I mean, we shouldn't be using them. It doesn't matter how many reds or blues or greens you have on your team. That is not the relevant factor. It does matter if you only have one type of person with one perspective. Homogeny is bad. But the idea that you can assess on the basis of colors, I mean, that is as accurate as all those tests that I do that say, which Jedi would you be? That's how accurate they are. Introversion is not a statement about the capability of a person to deliver in front of crowds, to be assertive when the time comes. It is a statement about the energy that is required for that to happen. Important, and again, even that, such a broad generalization, for me, introversion means that I find human beings energy expensive, but entirely worth it. It does mean that at the end of a day, when everybody else might be like, oh, we've had a great day. We've done, done some amazing collaboration. Let's go out for a drink. For me, that is akin to asking me to wander to Mordor. It, it is, and not because I don't like the people and not because I often lament as I sit alone with a glass of wine. I often lament the fact that I'm not out with people, but I also know that I just might die if I did that. It's just, it's too much and I need to, we always talk at APS Intelligence, we talk about refilling your cup and I need to refill my cup so I can be really good again tomorrow. I coached somebody, a straight white man, who almost didn't get a, a C-suite job that they are perfect for because their Hogan inventory said that they were an introvert. And the questions ranged from, well, how's he going to manage the tough stuff? How's he going to... And it was... This is such a disservice to leadership. It's such a disservice to the organizations that we're trying to build. That was an overly long rant, but I'm sorry, you, you started it. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> no, we'll take all of your over your rants. It's, it's, it's brilliant and it really resonated with me. And, you know, we, we've chatted to a lot of uh, business leaders recently, especially who have spoken on the topic of sobriety, you know, um, because especially in the UK, there's a there's a, definitely a culture of, you know, we'll go discuss something, you know, a business deal, the finer print, we'll go bond over a beer. But interestingly, a lot of the people that we've spoken to about this are actually younger, you know, people in their 20s who have been like, I just, I don't want to do that. So it's an interesting cultural shift, isn't it? It is. But we might be giving it too much gravity to call it a cultural shift. I mean, it's simply the idea that a group of people who are now raising their voice about this perhaps were ignored in the past or perhaps were so afraid that if they said, you know what, can we have a meeting where everybody isn't drunk at the end? would have caused them ridicule or actual that kind of constructive harm, that con constructive dismissal kind of harm. <clears throat> and now we're simply hearing those voices and people still roll their eyes at them, which is just crazy. Um, cause, cause it's the, I just don't, I want to get the best out of people. I want people to thrive. 
And I think some accommodation to make that happen is a normal part of the, the way of working. Some inconvenience on my part, say I would like to have a glass of red, which I often do, but not during business meetings. But the the I would have to go with sparkling water or something else is not such a big imposition to get a piece of work done in a way that doesn't cause harm to the person opposite. Mm. Not a big deal. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, but let's let's go back to kind of the start of APS and kind of, you know, what kind of led you to, to start the business in the first place? So originally it was simply, um, it was simply a vehicle for me to do stuff. It was that, um, <laughs> it was that basic. Uh, I want to do stuff with businesses. It's probably a good idea that I've got a vehicle for doing stuff with businesses. And at the beginning, the stuff was very much me doing stuff it was advisory services a little bit of comms advisory as well as the kind of regular business and leadership and <clears throat> culture advisory and then it was a bit of analytics that i would do myself consequently very expensive analytics and then then it was speaking and coaching those and 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 it kind of that's good and i enjoyed it but it was always this case of i leave and it felt like what have i there should be something more substantive that we can do to ensure the penetration of this invention, the intervention, right? I've spoken, you've been inspired, you've loved it, but you don't have access to me after that. So what about if I had a team that could do some amazing stuff, truly brilliant people who could come in and do additional training, additional advisory, additional coaching, and indeed at a price point that would make the entire intervention more long lasting with a better ROI, but not break the bank. And that's what built this new idea. But but nothing really changed with the organization until I stepped out of the way as CEO. Because I was CEO by, by like the letters were there under my name. But I've got no business being a CEO. I'm, I'm smart on governance and in a lot of different places. But the, the, our current CEO is the one who's really made the transformative difference. It's uh, perhaps for some of the people listening, it's one of those hard things, right? You, I'm the CEO. I'm the founder. I'm in charge. And, and I always, I just thought, I know what I want this to look like in the future. And I know that I'm not at the head of this, if it's going to look like that. And I, I found that I, the idea that I can just turn my back on some of the more logistical and other areas on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm still very much there for oversight and strategy, and focus on R&D, developing new stuff, and focus on delivering um, insights in a way that's truly penetrative, right? And that gets into the heart thing. I love the fact that people quote back stuff that we talk about, ways that we talk about things, like metaphors and examples that we use. My ability to focus on that has, has risen exponentially because I'm out of the way. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, as I mentioned, kind of at the, the top of all of this, you are an organization, organizational psychologist. And, you know, if you think back to maybe a younger you, um, was there was there a figure um, that really embodied leadership to you as you're growing up and you kind of reflect back and go, wow, that is kind of my ideal leader? Um, you know, was that ever something that you kind of thought about? So I had very good modeling of leadership in a very practical, hands-on sense. But it was, for me, it was my mom. She was this really good example. I don't know that when I was young, when I was, this is such an unfortunate thing. We don't often have the clarity of thought as a youth. We don't, we don't come to some of the conclusions that should be evident and obvious around us as a, as a, as a child, certainly. But I did recognize that she had this impact. It was her that got me kicked into to Star Wars. Uh, she didn't care about Star Wars, but I saw Star Wars and then I saw the way my mother behaved and I thought that there were commonalities. She didn't swing around a, a lightsaber, but the way she could talk to people and influence them and have and change their mood and state, she could modulate her voice in a way that people could who were experiencing extreme distress would would come down this ability to emotionally regulate her environment i thought was i didn't i didn't have the words for it back then obviously but on reflection that's exactly what it was and i just thought this was amazing and she's the one who i watched this i described it as being a jedi to a librarian and that librarian pointed me in the direction of psychology and that's why i'm a psychologist because i saw this behavior but also she did the minutia the things that leaders often forget, the minutiae. When people told her stuff, she remembered it. 
So if she were to talk to somebody uh, a week or two weeks or a month or six months later, and they told them about, I don't know, their dog getting hit by a car or they're expecting a child or they had a birthday or whatever else, she'd remember this stuff and be able to talk back about it. Um, she was an attentive, authentic, detail-oriented leader. Yeah, no, absolutely. That that being able to remember certain details and et cetera is something I know Richard Branson is well known for doing exactly that. He's he's got an incredible memory for people, you know, that, that may be kind of lower well lower on the ladder in Virgin, for example. Um and yeah, it's it's an incredible thing. But the the other thing kind of doing the research on you that I found quite funny and again similar to the introvert thing was you describe yourself as a lazy person and what what kind of made me laugh about that is that th there is definitely this negative connotation to a lazy person but at the same time what lazy people do by nature is find the quickest way to get a job done so could you could you tell us a little bit more about kind of your your di self-diagnosis of, of a lazy person so I am definitely lazy. Given a choice of an easy path or a hard path, I'll invariably pick the easy path. Um, but I like to win. And sometimes only the hard path, not sometimes, most of the time, only the hard path will get you through to victory, whatever that is in your context. Um so for me, the acknowledgement of laziness was really important because otherwise you blunder into poor decisions, not knowing why you're making them. Whereas when you know that fundamentally I'm lazy, and if you give me an easy out, I'll take it. You can build structures to stop that from happening. So my diary is a marvel, right? It's a marvel of engineering. It is like daily Tetris for my team. And I am, have you ever seen um, uh, Anchorman? Right, with Ron Burgundy and how whatever is written on the teleprompter he reads, no matter how egregious and terrible and often rude it is, he will read it. Well, my calendar, I am Ron Burgundy to my calendar. What it tells me to do is what I will do. I will show up, get it done, deliver, out, next thing. And so one of the ways that I can stop myself from leaning into the tendency of I've got a really comfortable chair upstairs that I'd rather be sat in right now, or maybe I could have a nap right now, is the fact that my diary just goes bang, 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 bang. And the goal for my team knows is to get me done as early as possible. If it can be six, that's great. I was going to say if it can be five, that's great, but that's, that's not real. But if it can be six, that's great. And, and I'll pack it in. I, I get up at 5.15, I'm at my desk often by 6.30 if I'm not in the gym, which is not as often as I should be. Um, and then I'll just just hammer it out. And this structure, and not just structure alone, but structure paired with the fact that I know how I'm contributing to the bottom line. I'm in enough of our other meetings to understand how what I'm doing here, this perfunctory, often dull piece that I have to do here at 10.30 to 10.45, how this is tying to our bottom line, to our to the benefit of a teammate or of a client or a colleague. And that's really important to me. How does this help us win collectively, not just me? Because then onerous stuff feels like being a teammate. You know, when I'm queuing, QAing a document uh, because I, I the, the, it requires my expertise, that can feel... For the best of us, it can feel like that's a bit beneath me, right? QAing a document... But then you realize how you're supporting your team, how your insights will polish this and make it just perfect so that we'll deliver and we'll win. And that team that's put in massive amounts of time, and I've just got this tiny contribution, I could just help polish it a tiny bit, maybe even one thing, and we have a better chance of winning. And their efforts will be rewarded, their hours and hours. of It feels like, it makes me feel like a teammate. And I love that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, the way you talk about your team is so brilliant there. But, you know, hiring is a massive, massive part of any organization. And, you know, talking, it was interesting hearing you talking about wanting to win. And in some cases, you stepping back as a CEO, for example, for the greater good will help the organization win. So as far as your kind of hiring, you know, kind of thinking back to the beginning of the APS journey, could you just just tell us a little bit about how you kind of found those key people to plug into the organization to get you to this point? I should probably start off by saying the, the the first thing is that how bad we've been at it at times, how bad I've been at it at times. 
uh, we we had a stage where we brought in five people. We grew very very quickly, and we brought in five people. And we, I'm very plain and direct, not uncivil, but plain and direct about you know sometimes this place is like it's like drinking from a fire hose. It, it really is, it, and I'm very plain and direct about my demands. I'm incredibly robust. I think thoughtless errors are unacceptable. I don't think that if you spell check a document, it should come to me and there should be a spelling mistake in it. I, these simple things to me are an indicator of how much scrutiny is required of something. And so I was very plain about the demands, you know, that, that we, we, we're we transparent with each other. Um, our say-do gap, we talk a lot about our say-do gap is very small. You say you're gonna do this, it's gonna get done. If you say it'll be done at this quality, by this time, I won't have to check with you because it'll get done. And we talk to people about this. And there was a period of time where we were telling people this and people were nodding vociferously and saying, yeah, that's what I'm into. And then they'd arrive. And even though we are so stringent about the, the amount of time people can work, I yelled at one of my colleagues the other day for sending me a message in Teams at 7.30. I was like, unacceptable. I want you for the long term. And, and I can't possibly rely on having you for the long term if you're extending your days. I get to extend my days. Peter, our CEO, gets to extend our days. You don't. And it's not because you don't matter, it's because you matter. But the, they, these guys churned in and churned out in like six months saying, you know, this is the worst place and it's too demanding. And we worked a thousand hours and none of that was a thousand hours certainly wasn't true, but the demanding was, but the frustrating part for us was that we told people attention to detail really is a dividend here. We demand that. So what we started to do is a, we've, we've sought out support from people who recruit really well traditionally, but we also didn't want to end up, as you may end up with traditional recruiters, with a very homogenous group of people showing up at your door. So we started to talk about the precursor qualities that were required from the very beginning. So talking about attention to detail and diligence and describing exactly what that meant in the context of our organization. Talking about accountability. I have a set of t-shirts that I used to wear an awful lot called that say accountability is sexy because it is. We love accountability, both group accountability, individual accountability, accountability for each other. And, and what we found is doing that has paid dividends um, in the kind of people we've got. The other part that we tell people is that this is a place where we like people to develop and grow. So you can start off as, as, a, as an EA and end up as a company director. You, you, you can start off as, a, as someone who's here to help with the website and end up as a, as a behavioral analyst for us. You'll have there's some qualifications. You can start off as, as somebody who just comes in to do a bit of adjunct um, co uh, training and you end up as one of our senior coaches. And we love this idea of the agility as long as we get the job done, or the agility to move around. Um, I don't. I don't think we're very good at helping other people, especially big organizations, to make their systems and processes, and indeed their approach to recruitment, help them to hire actually the best people, not just the best people who look a certain way or act a certain way. Um, but I tell you, it's been a painful uh, nut to crack for us personally. Yeah, and that's echoed in many of the people that we speak to. But another thing that, you know, kind of comes up quite a lot, especially with our audience, you know, you're looking at entrepreneurs and founders who are just ruthless, kind of exactly like you said, they are, the will to win is, is there. And, you know, what kind of comes up a lot with, when we speak to people is that they find it quite frustrating because, you know, the person that they've brought on board doesn't think the same way they do and they just go it's so obvious like why aren't they doing it but it's obvious to the founder not necessarily to the person who's working there um is this something that you kind of came across when you were building your company but also you know in the clients that you work with today so, so <clears throat> i do understand this sentiment it's not something i've encountered myself i've encountered it on the very pragmatic side so we've asked for diligence and attention to detail and you seem to think that that's optional i've encountered that kind of i don't understand why you don't understand but in terms of love uh we're very clear we're not a family i am incredibly suspicious of companies that say we're a family you don't pay your siblings to stick around you don't fire your siblings if they underperform you're not a family we are a close bond, and if you come for my team, I will eviscerate you. If they've made a mistake, that's our job. 
it's our job to give that critical feedback. But if you try and come for them, welcome to meeting me. So a duty of care, for sure. Uh, a conscientiousness. You know, if there's only one, we were talking, I was, I was eviscerating, speaking of that, um, personality inventories earlier. There is only one feature of the big five or the, the dimensions that is commonly cited that actually has a predictive uh, power for performance in the workplace, and that's conscientiousness. So I, I think that's the key. What is the level of conscientiousness that you should be able to demand? And it probably isn't. No, no, that's not fair. It definitely isn't working until nine o'clock every night and being up at five in the morning. It's definitely not being in the office every day for no reason other than I want to watch you work. It's definitely not working at the weekends. It's definitely not responding to my emails after hours. It's definitely not being available on the phone for, for, my, for my boss. Uh, out of hours just because I want it. It's definitely not cancelling holidays that I've pre-planned and booked. And I just think many founders think the commitment they have, especially when it's linked very often to the remuneration they can look forward to, it's, it's unreasonable to expect of other people. But there is this, this baseline of this is what commitment looks like here that I think should be shared with people. We occasionally, we work internationally, so occasionally we'll tell people, you know, we, we're going to have to work. There's a late one here. This will be till eight o'clock at night. But we always um, uh, time off, you know, time off in, in lieu. You, you give that toil. And, and that's how you make sure that people understand that you understand the balance, that you have a life. Uh, don't ask for people to be as committed as you if they're not going to be in the same pool as you when you sell your business. Part of, you know, a, a, a scaling businesses journey is kind of the, you know, kind of accessing funding. Um, and, you know, for yourself at APS, could you just tell us a little bit about your kind of funding journey, um, just to give us a bit of, more of an understanding of the company itself? Yeah, it, it's, so the funding part is really fascinating because we've, we've not taken any external funding at this point at all. It's been the job of the directors uh, and the shareholders to reinvest in the business when we when we see opportunities for growth, and even through lean times when we see the opportunity to maintain our colleagues, to keep our colleagues in place, at least until we prove through this this difficult period. So that that's that's been our journey. We've been, uh, the, you know, we've been offered money. There's been special uh, acquisition vehicles, and there's been. Um, other large companies that we respect and like who have approached us but at this point we haven't we haven't taken that leap and i think because because what we do in r and d can very much be done on the backs of uh, of our unpaid efforts and I, by that i mean mine and, and other directors unpaid efforts we haven't had to kind of set aside a, a pot for r and d to make that happen um, I think there's going to be a point where investment is going to be a really interesting opportunity. Um, but quite frankly, I'll be in the same boat as many of your listeners here when it comes to that. What I do know is that ethical congruence will be important. Mission orientation will be important. Um, a team orientation will be important. And anybody who works with me will think people are important, even if they're energy expensive. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and kind of look at the puzzle that is that is you. And, you know, some of the terminology you've already used, you know, being part of a team, um, etc. You know, could you just tell us a little bit about your sporting career? Because you did play in the NBA for a little bit. And I think that's an interesting kind of piece to that to that John Amici puzzle. I think the, probably the most important bit about me as an athlete which even as i say that is so weird because i can see myself and i don't look like an athlete anymore if i ever did um the most important part of me as an athlete is the idea that i set out to do something that people said was impossible and i did it nonetheless i told the world everybody who would listen it's in my school yearbook actually my grammar school yearbook that i would play in the nba and I'd been playing at that point for three months. 
I decided I would play in the M NBA after my first 45 minute basketball session at a gym in Cholton, a horrible community college that now does not exist, <clears throat> in a gym that smelled very strongly of urine. And it was 45 minutes after that, I walked out into the pouring rain, Manchester. I walked out into the pouring rain. And as I was walking to the bus, I was like, like yeah, that, you know, the, the, phys the, the physical part, the, the sport itself was immaterial. But I was like, this room full of people who looked at me, and when they looked at me, all I could see was my own potential. They weren't afraid. They didn't run away. They didn't poke a stick. They didn't make fun. They didn't ask, oh, how tall are you? None of that stuff. It, it was like the most welcoming space. And, so I, and they told me about this thing called the MBA. I didn't know what the letters meant at that time. I was like, yeah, I'm doing that. And I made that decision. And then six years later, I was starting in the MBA. I was in the first five of the Cleveland Cavaliers. It's something that has not been done. To that point in the NBA, it had never been done that somebody had started at the beginning of the season after never being drafted, after coming from, you know, nowhere. That's the most important thing about it, because otherwise, I put a ball in a hole. It's amazing. It's quite chastening, actually, when you... Uh, Anybody who's listening, however important what you, I was talking to somebody the other day, yesterday actually. Um, she's she's a leader who is in our giant community, and and she what she's doing is groundbreaking in the med tech space. She showed me some MRI pictures that just blew my mind, and so, and I looked at what she's doing, and I'm like, what you're doing is truly consequential. It's it's amazing, but it's quite chastening. For, for many of us, if we boil down what we do into its lowest common denominator, and if you're a professional athlete who plays basketball, what you do for a living is you put a ball in a hole. And all of a sudden, you can talk about revenue, you can talk about your salary, you can talk about excited children in the stands, but I put a ball in a hole for 15 years. And it's really important for us to understand however important our pursuit, they're not all equally important. Yeah, and I played sport, I entertained, that's what I did. Whereas now I get a chance every once in a while to, to steal the resolve of somebody who might change um, medicine. I get to support somebody who perhaps without my intervention wouldn't be a stellar C-suite executive making the lives of the people around them better. I get to do stuff that actually means something now. Whereas not in my previous career so much. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that the, the business community has always been very obsessed with sports, but I would say primarily in the kind of mindset side of things. So if you're looking at, you know, for example, for yourself, you, you played for Doc Rivers in Orlando, um, well known as, as an incredible leader of people. Um, you know, you're looking at people like Phil Jackson, for anyone who's kind of watched The Last Dance, you, you know, you, you're talking about incredible people. So when you reflect on your career of, of the people, you know, were kind of head of those locker rooms, do you, do you look back fondly on that period and kind of what you learned from those people? I learned from all of the coaches that I had, but only very few of them were very good. And I mean, as I'm not talking about technical ability. That's to a penny. Anybody can do that part. I'm talking about people who were great leaders of elite athletes in a team format. Doc Rivers was one of them who was great, but many of the others that I, I played for were very poor, incredibly poor, shatteringly poor. But I learned lessons from them too. I suppose... If there's anything I could encourage people watching this is, is just remember that most people take the wrong lessons from sport. That's, that's, that sounds bombastic, but it's not hyperbole. It is the truth. You, most people take the wrong lessons from sport. I watched a video. I use it in my training, actually. I watched a video of this young girl. She's, an, I think, a Chinese girl who is... Um, crawling on her hands and knees. Her hands are bloodied, her elbows are bloodied, her legs are bloodied. 
and she's crawling to get across the line while people are cheering her coach is standing by her. And I look at the comments every time this resurfaces every six months or so online. And people are like, this is what sport's all about. This is the greatest thing. And I'm like, are you kidding me? The only great leader who could have been in that picture would have been one who was punching people who were, who, who were cheering her on, grabbing this girl and, and saying, and she was a girl, she was just a, a, a youngster, under 16, I think, and saying, stop, you've done enough. What are the chances that, that girl's really keen on sport today, I wonder, as she looks every day in the mirror at the scars on her hands and on her forearms and on her elbows, on her knees and her shins? What are the chances that she looks at herself and says, yeah, this scarring was definitely worth it for a plastic silver medal or bronze? or a participant medal. The lessons from sport that people really need to take are that of recuperation. I spent a fraction of my time as a professional athlete giving an effort that most people will never understand. So extreme, so deep. And the rest of that time was spent not resting, not crashing, which is what many of us do as, as business people. We don't, we're not actually resting. We're just, we're so tired, we just stop. That's not recuperation. And you wonder why you're tired the next morning. But ice baths, um, um, yoga, stretching, uh, sleep, proper amounts of sleep. This, this idea of marginal gains is such a cop-out. You know, it's not about shark skin swimming suits. In, it's not about bananas and coffee stations in your workplace. It's about leaders who make doing difficult work less energy expensive. That's a marginal gain. That's how you win. Take the right lessons from sport. Build teams. When they've done enough, make them go home. Demand the most from them for the periods of time that are reasonable, and then make them recuperate. Make them fill their cup. I feel really strongly about this because we're in this world of resilience now where everybody thinks resilience is a good thing. And you just need to know that if your people have to be resilient all the time, your workplace is broken. Resilience is episodic and it's shared. Everybody has to deal with it for a moment, but it's only for a moment. The other thing I wanted to, to kind of ask you about is, um, is failure is obviously a massive part of business and obviously sport too. I mean, there's that great stat that no one's made more game winning shots than Michael Jordan, but no one's you know, missed as many game winning shots as Michael Jordan. So um, as far as kind of, you know, failure in the workspace, you know, especially for yourself, you, you, you're working with businesses that are at various stages of growth, you know, you, you're on the advisory boards of, you know, FTSE 100 companies. But, you know, as you kind of look at the relationship to failure in those companies, is it still a negative view of it or people kind of past that and, and, and kind of looking at the lessons and the positive sides of failure. Yeah, I, I think there are people who understand that some failure can be positive. I just don't think they know which failure is which. Because not all failure is positive. Um, if you repeat a, a, a process that is flawed and end up with another failure at the end of it, that's not positive the second time round. Because the first time round would have been even that wasn't in and of itself positive, but what makes it positive is retroactive. Here's a process that I followed to achieve this outcome that I desired. It didn't meet that outcome. And then you ask yourself questions, what went well? Even better if learnings, actions, you incorporate those into your next process and then upon success, or at least very substantial improvements, then is the point where the previous thing becomes a win, becomes that failure becomes a good failure. It's a neutral failure until one way or the other, but repeated failures based on the same process, that's a bad failure. A neutral failure turns into a bad failure. I think you're right that people are starting to understand that that there can be good failures, but I just think people aren't very acute in how they decide which is which, and I think they often decide too early whether it's a good failure or a bad failure, because you often see people crucified on the basis of a bad failure that's been instantly announced. And that failure has led to learnings that have helped an organization make, uh, you know, often, often make that leap, that innovation leap, but that person's still been sacrificed. And if that's how you're operating as a business, you're never going to get what you want, because 
we talk about innovation, innovation, what do they say? Uh, failing fast is innovation. But if every individual knows that their failure will crush them, they'll either be ejected from the business or tarnished forever by that failure, they're not going to be willing to come forward and step up and help you innovate. So, yeah, we've got to be smarter about how we see failure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and what would you say is the trend that you've noticed with the clients that you're working with that gets you the most excited? Is there something that has come across, say, you know, especially kind of pre-COVID, I, I, I hate the term new normal, but in the new normal, is there anything that kind of gets you really excited that you just go, this this is promising and I, I'm excited for the future? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the future world of work. I don't talk about the new normal because it's not. Uh, the new normal is what people say when what they really mean is it's the old normal plus a day at home. <laughs> That's, they don't mean anything substantive change. I'm talking about the future world of work where we think differently about how our organizations work. I did, um, I'm going to see if I can find it for you, but I did this, this exercise and it, it was in the before times. It must have been six or seven years ago where I was looking at how organizations are going to shift and change over time. Uh, I'm sure I won't be able to find it quickly enough right now for you, but uh, it, that's what it is. It's workplace transformation. Uh, this makes for great podcasts right here with me doing stuff <laughs> in the background while everybody's listening. Apologies. So, um, this is the idea that, that workplaces are shifting and they're moving from transactional resource management to authentic people leadership. They're moving from hub working, everybody heading from the outskirts of a major city into the center of a major city to work five days a week, you know, 10 hours a day in this space to remote spot working, which is partly, it's not just because people's habits and moods have changed because of, but this movement was happening before because it's expensive and impractical for families to live always within two hours of where they're going to work. Then there's this idea of we're moving from homogenous cultures, big corporates with 100, 200,000 people who think that everywhere they are, in every jurisdiction, in every geography, they're going to be have the same culture, and instead moving to this dynamic and adaptable, still similar, so more like dialects of the same language as opposed to the different languages entirely, but certainly not just this homogenous everybody is. And the biggest, one of the biggest, there's a bunch of them, these shifts, but one of the biggest is this idea of the, the movement from a utilization culture, which, which has come about simply because of billing. It's not come about because of its actual utility, but utilization cultures shifting to learning cultures. You'll be familiar with that. Um, was it a McKinsey study in 2016 that said between 2016 and 2030, 75 to 375 million job roles globally will shift? I'm sorry, people having their head down doing billable hours in the face of a, of a workplace and a, and a world that's going to require some fairly radical shifts in almost every sector is short-sighted. Your cultures have to move to this dynamic, agile learning cultures. That's what I'm interested in. That's the future world of work, not new normal that's the, and there are people doing really exciting work in that area yeah it's it's really really interesting that you say that because I, I i agree with you i think it was a, the future of work institute that said 80 percent of the jobs that will exist in 15 years time don't exist today and you just think like that is meant especially from like you know an education side how do you prepare for something that doesn't exist you know what i mean to, yeah. to 15 years ago you wouldn't know what a social media manager now is everyone everyone has a social media manager you wouldn't know what um, an AI uh, prompt uh, creator was. And now there are big firms hiring AI prompt creators because the question, the quality of the question you ask is really the important thing for the most successful outcome. I just, it's, I just, I hope people realize, even if you're in a, this really brilliant, you know, founding stage with your organization, it's not going to look that way for very long. And the people you need they won't fit some job description that you've just created. You've got to think about not someone who can do this job today and tomorrow, but who is adaptable enough to do the work that needs to be done right now and morph into someone who can do some of the work of the future as you build and grow. Uh, it's now time for a very special segment. We've teamed up with the Jill Dando News Center to bring you the, new, the good news postcard. Your question today, John, comes from Oliver, age 12. 
Hello, I am Oliver from the Jordan News Centre at World Community School Academy. My question for you is, within your workplace, how do you maintain respect and collaboration with your colleagues? What a lovely question. Thank you, Oliver. So, um, clearly a high achiever. I see the badges. This is excellent work. Um, how do you maintain respect? My team and I, we talk about um, some of the elements that are important for, for creating this kind of good collegial environment where people respect you and you can thrive. And it's about communicating effectively. So uh, clearly, eloquently, in a way that's designed for the person in front of you that you're talking to, to understand the best. So even changing how you talk so that person understands the best. It's about being trustworthy. So when you say you'll do something, that person can turn their back knowing that it will get done. When you promise something to someone, that person can walk away happy knowing that your promise will be fulfilled. It's creating, the, the big term for it is psychological safety, right? The idea that that person and the people around you, they can come to your space just as they are and they will be safe. No one will make fun of how they talk. No one will make fun of the clothes that they wear. No one will make fun of them because of their religion or their, 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 their sexuality or their, their gender or their skin color or anything else. These are the things that make amazing places to work and I, and I think amazing places to go to school. There's nothing worse than feeling unsafe in the space that you're in. And the very best way, I think, to establish respect between people is to help everybody to feel safe. Thank you, Oliver. Oh, no, that's, that's brilliant. It was a great question and it was a really brilliant answer. So thank you very much for that, John. And we, we are a business leader, so we have to ask you the question, what makes a great business leader? Oof. There's a couple of researchers that I, I really like um, who have done amazing work in this space. And... I want to, if you don't mind bearing with me a second, I want to, I, I want to quote them because they, that this is, this is something I quote all the time. And, and this woman is, is utterly uh, remarkable. Um, and she, she's written on leadership so much. So this is what I would say makes leaders um, vital. Uh, this is Barbara Kellerman, by the way, she said this in 2012, in spite of the widespread disappointment in and distrust of leaders in society at large, and despite the seismic changes in culture and technology, there has been little change to the prevailing paradigm of learning how to lead. No significant attempt to reimagine the model or to adjust in, to an era in which leadership is less about refining the individual and more about reimagining the collective. That's what, that's what leadership is. She says it so much more eloquently than I. It is people who recognize that it isn't about me. It's about us. Yeah, no, that's that's a brilliant way to leave it. And do you have any kind of final words for our audience, John? Yes, it's you. It's you. You'll be looking at problems. You'll be looking at challenges. You'll be looking at successes. You'll be looking at things that are happening around you. And you'll be wondering, is, is it this? Is it that? And I'm not saying that logistics and external factors and disruption doesn't get away, but your success or failure, it's you founders, leaders in organizations. And it's your interactions with people that will be the definitive measure. Someone once told me that um, your direct reports, children will know your name. Your direct reports, children, and they'll know you in one of two ways. They'll know you as the person who makes their parent or carer feel scared and stupid and insignificant and invisible. Or they'll know you as the person who challenges and supports their carer or parent in equal measure, who, who makes them feel energized and challenged and capable. And that's always our choice as leaders. It's you. I feel like I can run through a brick wall now. That's, that's incredible. That's, 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 a, that's a great way to leave it. And um, where can people kind of follow your journey online and, and all the great work that you do with APS? I am impossible to miss online. I am a prolific tweeter and uh, uh, on LinkedIn. I'm just under my name at LinkedIn, John Amici, and I'm at John Amici 
uh, at John Amici in most of my stuff. So it's either at John Amici for Twitter, at John Amici OBE for LinkedIn, uh, sorry, for uh, uh, TikTok and Instagram. Find me. My name is reasonably unique. <laughs>